J.R.R. Tolkien may be best known for The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, but an exhibition at the University of Oxford is revealing a lot more about the master of high fantasy. That's one of the most yeah, exciting things about the exhibition, I think, is that we can take people beyond the films and beyond somebody else's interpretation of Tolkien and actually show them Tolkien's original works. So these are Tolkien's maps, these are what he drew, these are the drawings that he created as he was writing the stories. It's for the first time that some of these items return to Oxford, where Tolkien spent most of his adult life as a professor of linguistics. This once-in-a-generation exhibition displays previously unseen objects from several countries, including manuscripts, artworks, maps and letters, which gave away many of Tolkien's secrets. So there's early plot notes for The Hobbit, um, where he changes the name of some of the key characters, and people might be surprised to find out that the wizard Gandalf was originally called Bladothin, and the head dwarf Thorin was originally called um, Gandalf. <laughs> the exhibition presents much of this extensive archive, alongside interactive elements such as three-dimensional map of his imagined Middle Earth. But I think Oxford really did help to um, provide the framework in which he was able to flourish as a literary genius. And I think that comes from his scholarship, his learning, his time spent in the Bodleian Library, his interactions with other scholars. The late author's personal world can be seen at the university's main research library until the end of October. Without a doubt, J.R.R. Tolkien built a universe on paper and spared no detail when it came to completing his most famous creation, Middle Earth. My next guest joins me to speak about how Tolkien achieved his dream. John Garth is an author himself and conducted extensive research in order to write his book, Tolkien and the Great War. Thank you so much for joining me today, John. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien is best known for penning The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. But what are some of his other works that we may not know about? Well, his real life's work was the Silmarillion, which he um, began during the First World War uh, and continued to revise and rewrite and enlarge uh, all the way until he died in 1973. Um, and the Lord of the Rings was really an extension of that book um, and a way of tying in his children's story, The Hobbit, to that larger mythology. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the Tolkien Maker of Middle-earth exhibition, there are letters, photographs, hand-drawn maps, watercolors, and notebooks from the writer that are on display. What can visitors uh, to the exhibit learn from looking at these things that they wouldn't have known before? Well, for one thing, we learn that he was uh, he had among his fans some very famous people. So uh, the uh, fantasy uh, humorous writer Terry Pratchett um, wrote to him at the age of 19, I think, uh, a fan letter. Um, uh, Joni Mitchell, the musician, was one of his fans. Um, we also find letters from Tolkien to his wife Edith. Uh, written when he was a, a young man at university here and training uh, for uh, the First World War, describing night manoeuvres in Oxford. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that Tolkien was an absolutely amazing writer, but tell us about his artwork uh, and the striking illustrations he created to accompany his prose. His artwork went through a number of revolutions when, when, when he was very young, and this is stuff that a lot of people simply have, will have no idea about. He wrote, he, he drew very symbolist pictures, uh, apparently conjuring kind of mental states, but in a mythological way. These were not tied to his mythology. Later, and especially for The Hobbit, uh, he really perfected his landscape work and he uh, p painted exquisite pictures, uh, which I've never seen uh, in the original. This is one of the gorgeous things about the exhibition is that we can see the, the brilliance of the colours and the, uh, the exquisite detail because these were, these were images um, no, not much larger than the book itself, incredibly detailed. 
Mm -hmm. Now, Tolkien would think of his illustrations as amateurish. Looking at them now, would you agree? Um, I think Tolkien was a very, very modest man. Um, these, these are extraordinary pictures. Uh, of course, it's sketch work uh, may have appeared amateurish, but he could certainly capture a landscape or the form of a tree. Um, and when he really set his mind to it, his work with color was just exquisite. Now, uh, his son Christopher Tolkien an announced last month that his father's The Fall of Gundolin is going to uh, be published in August. Uh, what do we know about it so far, and do you think it's going to be able to live up to his other masterpieces? The Fall of Gondolin was, was written um, in early 1917, almost straight after Tolkien came back from the Battle of the Somme, um, one of the, the, the truly major battles in world history, um, and he was convalescing when he wrote it. So he was in hospital or at home, um, and it reflects some of the, the fears and horrors that he witnessed there, but in a mythological way. So it is a Middle-earth adventure. Um, the whole story that he wrote then will, I believe, be part of that book. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that will form the core of the book. And then there will be later versions that Tolkien wrote, which are shorter, um, or there will be, an, I think, an unfinished version Tolkien wrote, which is just one of his most beautiful pieces of prose, written when he had completed The Lord of the Rings and his writing had uh, risen to, to great heights. All right, John Garth, thank you so much for giving us that great insight on the most groundbreaking author, J.R.R. Tolkien. Thank you.